lovely to see everyone here. Lovely to be in beautiful Barcelona, especially if you come from freezing cold, rainy London, as I do. My name is Gaia Vince. Um, I'm a writer, was a scientist, and I, my passion here is about trying to understand the different ways that humans are and have been changing the planet and how we might change it for the better for ourselves, which, which could be called geoengineering, in fact, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. We live on an unusual planet, a beautiful planet, and the most obvious signature of that is it's blue, it's the blue dot. And that's because it has water, and water is vital to life as we know it in the universe. We all evolved in the oceans. We've since come out of the oceans, and we now rely entirely on fresh water for our survival. That's human survival. And fresh water just makes up a tiny, tiny percentage, a tiny fraction of the amount of water on our planet. The problem is not that there isn't enough water on the planet. There is enough water. The oceans contain more than enough water for all of us. But in turning it into the water we need, we need to use energy. So that's, that's something that we need to think about and people are thinking about. But the relationship between energy and water goes the other way as well. So water can provide us with energy. In fact, the Industrial Revolution began in the rivers of England, which powered the water wheels, which set the first industrial processes going. And we still use that. We use water and energy in all sorts of different ways. Windmills to raise the water that needed to drain countries like the Netherlands. So this session is going to look at our need for water and our need for energy. And we've got some amazing speakers who are going to talk about some really, really interesting and diverse ways that we can harness both. And harnessing water and energy is what gave our species the edge over all the other species. It was when we were able to harness energy in the form of fire and harness water in the form of water-carrying pouches like bladders from animals and uh, ostrich eggs, we used those, that we were able finally to escape our ecological African forest niche and expand across the whole planet. And now we live from the frozen Arctic to the deserts of Australia. We live from the sodden plains of the Sundarbans and Bangladesh to the uh, agrarian plains, to Siberia, Mongolia, to Canada. So water is energy. And the thing is, the, the, the problem we face is that we don't all live along the coast where we can get water. A lot of us rely on water that is available naturally. And, and just, just, just to think quickly about the challenges that actually millions, if not billions, of people around the world face. How many of you here, sitting here, have had to live for three or more days with only the water that you can get from the environment. So no tap, no piped water, and no bottled water. How many of you have lived three days or more? Put your hand, raise your hand. Very, very few. And yet, for almost all of human existence, this is what we survived on. We could only survive on the water that we brought towards us by geoengineering it through changing river sources, through uh, mining it in wells, creating artificial lakes, reservoirs, canals. It's a big challenge, and lots of people still have to walk hours and hours a day and carry the water they collect on their backs. So here, I'm going to concentrate. I spent... Um, two and a half years traveling around the whole world looking at the challenges that we face as we change the planet and looking at various people who are looking for solutions for their communities or their families or for the wider world and how we might meet those challenges. One of my journeys took me here, high altitude desert. This is Ladakh and it's squeezed in the Himalayas between Pakistan, India and China. It's incredibly beautiful, it's incredibly dry. It hardly ever rains here. And the people survive for their drinking, washing, agriculture requirements entirely on glacial meltwater. But as we change the planet, as we heat it up, those glaciers are melting. 
and the precipitation is becoming less and less reliable. So the people who live here, the Ladakis, they are mainly, um, they, they herd a cow yak hybrid to live at this very high altitude above 4,000 meters and they also farm barley. But with the glaciers that they rely on melting, most people are leaving now to go to the slums on the outskirts of the cities like Mumbai and Delhi. And this is happening globally as people face drought. I met a retired railway worker who came up with a solution for his community to keep them there, to keep the Ladakhi language surviving, to keep the culture and tradition of these people alive. And what he did was he looked for a location in the shadow of the mountain, so an area, of the, uh, an area high up where it was in shadow for a large portion of the year, so from sort of October, November to March, April. He then, by hand, with hand tools and involving the community, dug a trench, and then he made channels piping water and moving it around from glaciers much higher up, so above 6,000, 7,000 meters, above 6,000 meters. And he diverted the water there so that then it slowed down and had time to freeze in this area over winter. And that's his artificial glacier that he created. And the meltwater from this glacier is so precious it melts in, in April, which is the sowing season, and it's so precious that people, villagers, stand guard over the little sluice gate to make sure that the channels that have been carefully carved to go to each farmer's field are guarded and nobody takes more than their fair share. So this artificial glacier is not a replacement for real glaciers. It's not going to last forever, but it's a stopgap solution. It's a solution that may buy the villagers time while they find another way of living, another way of surviving. And actually, the bonus of global warming is that the warmer temperatures, and now with the water, mean that instead of one barley harvest a year, they're getting three harvests every year. And they're not just harvesting barley, they're also harvesting wheat, even uh, fruit trees, tomatoes, things like that. So that's completely turned the fortunes of this small area around. But high altitude deserts don't just occur in, in Asia, in the Himalayas, they're also occurring in the Andes, and there people also face the same problems. This is Chuang Norfell, this is the ra railway worker who, who did this incredible thing in Ladakh. So here in the Andes, in the Peruvian Andes, where they also rely on glacial meltwater to irrigate, in this case, alpaca pasture, they've come up with another solution, which is to literally paint the mountain white. And these people, that's Geronimo Torres and um, his friend Marco, I think, and they are carrying white paint up to the mountain to paint it. There used to be a glacier there, but it melted, and now the rock underneath is black. And they're hoping that by painting the mountain white, they will increase its reflectivity, and ice will form and freeze, and apparently it's starting to do that. I think this is ridiculous. I don't think this is going to work, but I do think it's testimony to the the challenge that we face, that people are literally undertaking, this is what they've painted so far, they've got that left to paint. People are so desperate to stay in their cultural homeland, in their community, rather than disappear off to the cities, that they are willing to literally painstakingly paint a mountain white. Incidentally, this project got money from the World Bank. Um, it won a prize. You know, I don't... I don't really know what to say about that, except, <laughs> except, you know, this is a sign of desperate times, and if people are willing to paint a mountain white, they're willing to try anything, and there are solutions out there. This is probably not one of them. But when these people migrate, when they can't live there, 
When they can't live in their mountains anymore, they move to the cities. And the second biggest desert city in the world after Cairo is Lima in Peru. And that's where villages, villagers like this end up. And they end up on this very dry city, and they live in slums. And when people move to slums, they have nothing except um, the uh, except the cardboard and the plywood that they uh, that they construct their small little dwellings out of. Then they get hooked up to electricity. Water is the last thing they get, and they pay an extortionate amount of money for water because they don't pay the cheap metered rate of piped water. They have to pay for a water tanker to visit them. So this is an experiment which I don't really have time to talk to you about much, but what it is doing is it is harvesting the fog that is coming off the coast, and they're doing it not just in Peru, they're also doing it further down the coast in Chile, and they're also doing it across the Namibian coast as well. It harvests the fog water. These are experimental fog nets, and underneath, the water drips down, and then they capture it, and they're going to try to create a forest, to try to water saplings with this fog water. And the idea is that they're creating an entirely new ecosystem, and this new ecosystem will be self-generating. You heard um, Kate Rayworth talking earlier about regenerative systems, about this sort of idea of a circular economy. This is the circular natural economy. The water is harvested from this. It will build saplings. It will create a forest, and the forest itself will retain the moisture and feed those homes. Um, I don't have much time to talk about more things, but we're going to hear from some really extraordinary people who are going to tell you some other ideas. But if you want to read some more, you should read my book, because there are lots in there.